Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talks, where we talk with developers about the processes, about what makes them go, about what they're concerned about, about what they're happy about. And today, I'm very happy to have a very special guest, uh, somebody who I call a real developer. There's a lot of developers out there or people who call themselves developers. This I learned from Mickey, but you know, he complained one time. He was like, Amir, you know, the real deal talks to all these developers. And uh, you know, you call them developers, you put them up on stage, and you know, some of these guys have only built one building in 10 years. So I don't know how you call them developers. You know, maybe you should call them, you know, one-time developers. But Mickey is really a proficient and uh, uh, a, de a developer, and he's constantly building stuff. And there is no greater sign of that than what he's doing now at the Benson in the middle of of a pandemic, he's developed uh, one of the first new developments in the Upper East Side in a really long time. But before we get into Mickey, I want to thank our uh, sponsor. If you have any accounting needs, please reach out to the folks at Burton Accounting. They do a great job. They represent a lot of people. And I want to thank them for these uh, broadcasts to happen. From my understanding, they also represented uh, you know, a president of the United States. I don't know which one, you could probably figure it out, but they do represent a lot of developers. Uh, Mickey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amir. Great to be here. Absolutely. Mickey, uh, I'm, it's so nice to see somebody developing something in the middle of a pandemic. You had the construction slow down and everything else. And I just read recently uh, that you guys actually sold the penthouse at asking price. Tell us about that. Right. So uh, we're actually developing a few projects and, and I would be happy to, to share with you uh, but uh, the Benson, I think we, we kind of, uh, um, without knowing about the pandemic, our timing was, was about the entire portfolio was very, very well because we enter into the pandemic without any inventory of units that are ready to go and to sell. So that was a good thing for us. Having said that, we are in a process of uh, ready to launch uh, the Benson, which is, you're absolutely right, but with a slight uh, a nuance, it's the first uh, project, uh, a new project, a ground up construction on Madison Avenue in over 25 years, uh, which is astonishing. Well, now, is you wasn't there one on Madison Avenue on 75th and uh, Madison at the uh, that, that's that's a that's a conversion. I'm talking that was about a conversion, got it. Yeah. yeah. And as you know, I did a lot of conversion in, in my career, which are very nice, but it's completely different than you. You were the first that, uh, you know, you did the plaza conversion, which was the I big. I did the plaza. I did, I did the, the conversion of the gift building to 25 Fifth Avenue uh, to residential 655 Sixth Avenue. Many, many buildings, but, uh, but obviously the plaza was the biggest and right. financially the most successful one. But going back to, to the Benson, so look, the reason that, you know, and, and there, there is a, there is a, a group of, of buyers that the only place they want to live in New York City is anywhere between Park, Park to Fifth Avenue, high 60s to let's call it 80 or mid 80s. That's the only place that they want to live. Yeah. And the only option they had was basically buying into core buildings that some of them are very very famous mm -hmm. but you know they are old buildings and you can you can go through a three four years of a three four summers of renovating the unit because you allow only to do renovation during this the summer. This is for the co-ops. This is the Park Avenue co-ops you're talking about. Right, Park Avenue or Fifth Avenue. But, but but those buildings you can't change the size of the windows. You, the risers are the old risers. The elevator okay. is there. You don't have amenities and so on and so forth. The problem is that, it, that every um, owner of property on Madison Avenue uh, is, is holding their yeah. property. They don't want to sell. But isn't, aren't these guys reliant, the Madison Avenue guys, really reliant on the retail business and the retail business? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Now, even if you have, and, and since the pandemic, you do find here and there buildings on Medi Madison Avenue that, that are for sale, but those are anywhere between 16 to 20, 22 footer. You can't really create a development. Yeah. So what we did, it took, a, it took us a few years. I had to buy four buildings that mm -hmm. 
together. Yeah. And obviously four different uh, uh, sellers with many different characters, with rent stabilized units, with retail and so on and so forth. It was a, a big undertaking to get to a point that everyone were happy and I could be in a position that I can demolish this building and build a brand new building. And this when you're in a position like that, isn't it, it's very important for you to make sure that all the deals go through. Did, right. the, did the neighbors knew that you were trying to buy all four of them or did you approach them individually or how, how did that plan work? Completely, like? each one separate. They didn't Never know. Talk to each other? Because I would figure if they talked to each other, they would be like, hey, we could probably get more out of this guy. Correct, but the first two know, and then the third and the fourth, yes, they already knew about it. And the fourth one, as always, was the most difficult one. He didn't want to meet with me. He, he, he doesn't live in New York, by the way. He didn't want to live with, uh, to meet with me. He didn't want to sell. And eventually when I spoke with him on the phone, he said, I don't need your money. I have so much money. I don't need your money. I don't want to sell. Don't waste my time. <laughs> eventually we got it done. I had to go to uh, a, a farmland uh, an hour away from Washington DC and spend the time with him over there. Fantastic, huge farm. And then he didn't agree to sell it. Then I had to fly to Malibu because he moved to Malibu in the summertime to be next to his grandchildren. And when I got there, eventually after a couple of drinks, he said, you know what? You're so persistent. Okay, I was... <laughs> So was he, a, he was a former New Yorker, obviously, or he owned the building. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he, was a, he had, you know, very nice life. He worked very hard from age 20, 21 to age 50, yeah. so about 30 years. And that's, that's it. Accumulate X amount of properties, right. move to, moved away from New York, right. and, to, uh, and just uh, that's it. Collect his uh, rent. Who puts these, uh, like who sources the deals for you? Do you actually source those yourself or how, how do you how do you source the deals? I know you have a team and everything, but- Yeah, you, so we, you have, have we, have a, we have a very, we have a big, not very big, we have a, we have a good uh, acquisition team here. Mm -hmm. They're working uh, really hard, trying mm -hmm. to, as we speak right now, we, you know, we're sourcing deals and obviously it depends on the market and our, what, what we feel is the right, uh, the right moment to buy. But yeah, they are, they are working uh, all the time uh, trying to bring, the, we have weekly and twice a week uh, acquisition meetings mm -hmm. and we discuss, uh, you know, the, the different deals. The truth of the matter, 99% of the deals we say no, or we bid and they're just too expensive to our taste. Mickey, like as a developer, you're always on the hunt to develop. Like as long as people will give you money, there's no bad market. There's no good market. You're just like, let me, as long as I can find the money to do it, I'm going to go out there and develop. And I know you guys put your own, a lot of your own money into it separately from a lot of other developers who only use investors' money. You actually invest your own money into the deals as well. But like, is there a bad market for you? I mean, Absolutely. The, the idea of a luxury market right now in New York with like a vacancies at an all time high where some of these condos are gonna have to convert to rentals. Uh, there is, you know, is, is there a bad market? I mean, can you see uh, the next year for you guys to build anything new? Uh, so you're absolutely right with the second part, but I, I want to correct you on the first part. We actually, we actually, very careful uh, many times, if, if you look at my career, we are very careful, hope maybe, maybe a little bit smart, but also lucky to time the cycles uh, as, as good as possible. So for example, from 2015 to late 2017, we didn't buy anything. It's not that we didn't try. We, we underwrite hundreds of deals and we bid on a lot of deals. But, you know, because we know, because we do invest a lot of our money and because our mentality, my mentality, is that the only reason we should do a deal is only if it makes financial sense. Mm -hmm. We don't do stupid deals. We don't look at, at, uh, at, oh, we play with other people money and that's because we generate whatever, that's the reason we do we did deals. No, the only way we make money is if those deals are profitable. Right. Otherwise, we are not making deals. So ju just to correct you on that, from 15 to late 17, we didn't buy anything. Now, now you can ask me, okay, but even if you bought in, in 18 and now in, in the pandemic. But 
what started to happen in 18, prior to that, every piece of land was asking $1,000 a foot, regardless where, where it was. Right. Starting 18, here and there, very selective, we found deals that were, we didn't, didn't, uh, didn't happen for a few years, for a couple of years, and we came in and we bought them at 20, 25% discount. We didn't steal those deals. Mm -hmm. We just bought them at the basis right. that allow us to have enough room to, to, to run with the cycle right. and not to be in a position that you're up to here and you're so tight that if the cycle is changing on you, you, you basically lose the, the property. So right. again, I don't want to jinx anything, but we are in a position today, and I will say what we, what we are developing right now, but we're in a position today that we are looking at new deals. Mm -hmm. We have, at this point of time, we, then, we don't have problems in our portfolio. Yes, the rental, the rental portfolio that we have, we, we, have uh, we are collecting uh, about, depends on the location, anywhere between 15 to 20% less than what we collected before. But we don't That's have a lot to... better than a lot of other people. I mean, a lot of the people we're talking to are expect, accepting less than that. I, I, here is the thing. Manhattan, um, you see that the, the biggest problem is in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Most of our rental portfolio is in Brooklyn. And interesting enough, Brooklyn is, act, I mean, it's not perfect, yeah. but we are, we, yeah. are, we are playing at around 15% less, maybe 15 to 20% less. But the other thing is leverage. If you don't have high leverage on your properties, it's not that we don't have financing, mm -hmm. but if you don't have high leverage, you can, you can deal with 15%, 20%, uh, you know, you don't make as much money, okay, but for a couple of years, and hopefully things will come back. Right. But uh, let me. And let I can me, tell you more about the Benson because we kind of. I didn't answer your question. You're excited about the Benson. It's your project. When did you guys break ground on that? By the way, I'm, I'm just curious. So, so we we broke ground at the at the beginning of uh, of the year. We already done with the. So, so you were already in the mix of it. You were already pregnant. You 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 were moving forward no matter. What. Oh, absolutely. And and the thing was that you you were right. You know, going back to uh, to mid March or beginning of April, we had to close to shut down the construction. Mm -hmm. We realistically we lost about three months because even when when you when we were able to start, you know, it's it's not like a switch on and off, mm -hmm. and everything is immediately great. So we lost um, about three months in the construction. Now originally I was planning to open the sales, kind of, kind of a April mid April. And when we closed down everything in, uh, in March, I said, hold on, let's see where we're going, where, where we're heading to, and we'll make a decision. Mm -hmm. It might take us longer to sell, but there is no, obviously you can't open a sales office when everything is shut down. Right. Interesting what happened to us. While we were building on site, when we came back and, and building, and you know, only from the sidewalk bridge, we started to get phone calls and emails mm -hmm. asking about the project. Oh, wow. And I said, okay, if that's the case, let's finish the sales office. And we open it seven weeks ago. We opened the sales, the sales office seven weeks ago. And it was really purely about, okay, understanding what the market is telling us and seeing that there is an interest I, in it is not it's not just like an everyday development right like you're you're low you start off at like 12 13 million dollars for that how many units are in there correct so we have we have only 15 units but they are big the biggest one is 6600 square feet and look in 7 weeks we sold pentos b mm -hmm. full ask 35 mm -hmm. million dollar and by the way i'm re you're recording me so i know you're going to check me and that's okay full that's ask yeah, yeah. <laughs> 35, 35 million dollar. We sold Pento C full ask, 22 million dollar. We sold the full floor unit for just shy of 15 million dollar full ask, and if we sold another four a uh, full uh, flo uh, four unit yeah. for about 13 million dollar and another unit. We are in seven weeks yeah, just yeah. shy of 100 million dollar, and you know what? You're a very happy man. I'm very happy, but I, I but then we 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 looked at it and we said why. Look, we're not asking this project, the blended average is just shy of it's about 37, 3800 a foot. 
That's, that's, that's on the high side, though, Mickey. That is on the high side. You don't think that's on the high side? I mean, that's what they're asking on the high line, you know? Well, I, with, I'm sorry, with all due respect, <laughs> I think that being on Madison Avenue and 79th Street, for many people, it's more valuable. Right. Now, by the way, remember, there is no competition. Right. How much competition there is in the high line? So now, even now, if you, at least 99 developments that we counted, so exactly. So even if you have an, a beautiful, fantastic development, you have a lot of competition. So what works for our benefit is an unbelievable location, no competition, nothing was done there for so many years, and a beautiful uh, building. Right. But let me ask you this: There's gonna, you know, we're seeing more. Like whenever the market goes down. Uh, you right. see people showing uh, trouble and cracks and stuff in their uh, in their operation and in their projects. We're seeing a lot of that now. We're seeing it with some really established people, people who are very well-known developers. And in every cycle, we see that. We see people who are untouchable, just you know, breaking down and imploding during a bad market. And that's happening now. Do you foresee yourself going into an existing project that's unfinished to complete it or take over an existing project right now from other people? So we are we are uh, reviewing a lot of those projects, either those that are complete and there is a big uh, inventory uh, that they are just trying to sell as an inventory instead of a uh, unit one by one. And is that something you're comfortable doing? Because I know you guys do a lot of your in-house marketing. Uh, Danielle, your daughter handles a lot of that for you guys. But uh, are you comfortable taking on a project that you didn't develop? Because uh, have you ever done this before? Have you ever gone into a project where you didn't build yourself to? Uh... No, I, I was actually, and, 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 you know, unfortunately I didn't do it. I was very close to do what, uh, the, the, in, after the, the last day financial cycle, the, what, what was brand as one medicine that yeah. eventually related, they related it. Uh, and unbelievable at the time i couldn't i couldn't uh, i couldn't uh, I, I didn't feel comfortable that i can sell it for 18 1900 dollar food no. and they were brave enough they did it it was very profitable for them so yeah in the last cycle we looked at, dif at different things but i never did it this cycle we're looking at a lot of them but i mean what is interesting we're looking at some of them as an option to keep them as a re as rental sure. for yeah. for forever yeah. and not now there, there are some nuances here that okay what do you do with the project that let's say they have 50 units or 100 units and they sold 10 and you buy 90 mm -hmm. how do you deal with it and then is it possible to take an inventory like that and roll it into affordable new york because if you pay full taxes yeah you can't, I mean, it just, you, you can't keep it as a rental forever. It just right. doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of, a lot of fit problems and we're looking at projects that are half built. We didn't, we didn't pull the trigger yet, but we are looking at a lot of those deals. Yes. Do you see a benefit into adding, uh, buying them and turning, because, it, you know, developments that were built and designed to be condos are generally larger than developments right. that are designed to be rentals. So do you uh, see any challenges with that? Because are you oh. going to be able to co collect the same kind of rents or you have to increase the rents? How would that work out? No, so for example, one of those deals that you guys reported on and, uh, and you know, we, we walked away from is the corner of 86 and Lex. I forgot the name of the project. They didn't sell one unit over there. So at first we said, okay, you know, let's look at it. And, you know, on a dollar per foot, mm -hmm. uh, the, it, at first, before you really analyze it, it sounds okay. It, it makes sense. I will hold it for two, three years. I will sell it. Or maybe I will keep it as rental. But mm -hmm. as you just said, the units are way too big, mm -hmm. way too big anyway, even for, for to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and for this corner, it's a busy corner, right? So it, it didn't make sense for us to move ahead with, with the plan. I know that there is another very uh, a good developer or you know investor that is, is trying to get a deal done. We'll see what will happen. But mm -hmm. that's an example. You're right. If the units are too big, you can't, you know, you can't rent them out. People are saying, oh, you can get 70 bucks a foot, 80 bucks a foot. Right. But for what? For how big of the space? Right. Right. right? 
And then and let me ask you this. Let me paint a picture for you. We're in a world right now where no matter how you look at it, you know, people are just not going to take the same amount of office space that they were going to use right. before. So somebody who, you know, one of the main things about cities is that it draws people in because all the jobs are in the cities. And now if those jobs are able to be dispersed and they can be anywhere, why do you, do you see demand for condos and people coming to the city and the population of the city shrinking down and the need for luxury condos to go down? So first of all, our, our focus in, the, in the, the next few years is, is to build and buy rental uh, properties as, as much as we can and less condos, okay? Because we have, we have enough in the pipeline to build condos in the next uh, few years. So that's number one, but the same question is about a rental. Here is my overview about, uh, about New York. I do think that I mentioned it in, when you had me on, on the panel back in March, yeah. uh, but, but I have, I, you know, obviously we went, I thought that the pandemic would be over by now. Yeah, Maybe you too. thought the same, but um, you know, I, I, I still have the same. I don't believe that this whole notion and all the headlines that New York City is dead, I don't buy it. I, I don't buy that it's dead either, but I'm saying companies are coming out and saying, look, I just don't need 100% of my portfolio. I need 50% of it, right? I, I don't need my entire marketing here. My marketing people can be in California, you know? So there is gonna be less of a demand. That, there is no matter how you cut it or how optimistic you wanna be and how great New York is, that is gonna be a fact. And you got 400- I agree people. with you on the office space. I, my view, for example, we are we are uh, we 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 closed uh, during the pandemic a big site in uh, in Williamsburg on, on Kent Avenue, mm -hmm. and we are designing a project with a lot of rental units. Now it's going to take us between design and building and all that because it's a big project and and to get approvals and all that, it's going to take us about four years until the first tenant is going to move into the, the, the buildings. I don't have the crystal ball. I'm not trying to pretend that I know the future, mm -hmm. but I feel relatively comfortable about four years down the road. I mm -hmm. don't know to tell you the next year. I don't know, to, I don't know about two years. I feel very com relatively comfortable about, about the market in four years. Now, I want to tell you one more thing that I, I think some, some Zelle, uh, I don't know if he said, if, if you interviewed, I don't remember who interviewed him, but I, I agree with him 100%. And as you know, he owns a lot, of, uh, sure. a lot of properties. What is very interesting about New York, and we see it in our portfolio. Yes, the rents are down, but once you, you get to, you understand it as a landlord and you, you, you're not stubborn enough and you go, obviously you don't want to leave money on the table, but you, you go to the market, you lease everything. Mm -hmm. I have, going back to, to uh, May, we mm -hmm. had a lot of vacancies. Now we're at the 95%. Right. Now, why is that? Because we were, we were willing to play. Right. Interesting enough, Sam Zell said, San Francisco, it doesn't matter. You reduce the, the, the rent by 20%, by 25%, no takers. Right. And that's what is so nice about New York City. You look at the younger generation, they want to be here, Amir. Right. Maybe you and I can move to Florida and, and, and drink a nice drink on the beach. And you can <laughs> put me in that group. <laughs> <laughs> they want to be here. They want to be here. And you know what? The vaccine is around the corner. If it's a, a, a two months or five months, it doesn't matter because real estate is a long, is a marathon. But what's going to happen with all this space? I mean, we're talking about 470 million square feet of office space. What is going to happen with that space? It can't sit empty. I saw a lease for a sublease at 299 Park Avenue for $25 a square foot. $25 a square foot at the lever house where every hedge fund has to be at the lever house and pay $180, $200 a foot. Now they're subleasing there at less than $90 a foot. Right. Well, I mean, eventually, there's going to be a major shift. And at the same time, there's going to be these big buildings that are going to be sitting empty. What's going to happen to them? 100%. You're absolutely right. And I'm very happy. And hopefully it's not only luck and a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, knowledge about, about the different sectors. We don't invest in office. We don't invest in the retail market. Now, here is what might happen. Going back to the beginning of my career in New York, in the early, in 2000, 2001, to, in New York, I started before, but in New York, 
2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, I converted office buildings to residential. Right. Nothing is new. 655 Sixth Avenue, a full block on, on Sixth Avenue was an office building. Right. 225 was the gift building of New York. Uh, 49 is 20. The fact that the population of the city continued to grow, it allowed for those offices to be transferred, you know, converted into residential. My concern yeah. is that if the if all of a sudden I'm a middle manager who can do, doesn't have to be in New York, I don't have to pay this expensive schools. You're right. I have to pay the expensive taxes, and I have to deal with the nonsense, some of the nonsense that's going on. I feel like some of those people are going to be pulled away, not not only to Westchester or Long Island, but like even further out to right. you know, some of these uh, free tax states like Florida and like Texas, Florida. places like that. Right, or, or even to the to the West Coast, to Vegas, for okay. example. But okay. uh, and you do see that. Yeah. Here is the I, I the way I look at it. I look at the fundamentals. The world population is growing. You and I cannot change it. The world population is growing. The U.S. population is growing. So I think there will be a compensation. I have friends that are big developers in Europe, London, Paris, Rome. We obviously focusing on the U.S. market and focusing mainly, you know, New York and South Florida and to some extent LA, but the New York is kind of the, the hub. But we, you know, I look at what happened outside of, of uh, New York because I, I developed the, uh, out, you know, in, in Europe and, and in uh, as far as Singapore even. London feel very much deserted right now. Mm -hmm. Everything is closed. Shows are closed. Restaurants are, are half open. In Rome, 90% of the restaurants are closed. Wow. Now, let me ask you a question. To me, it's not the question about New York City. To me, it's the question, do we believe that the concept of urban living mm -hmm. is dead. Not only in New York. I don't buy it. I yeah. don't think it's the case. I think London will come back mm -hmm. and Paris will come. It's not only New York. And Paris will come back and Rome will come back. I and agree with way, you. When you, look, when you look at the Far East, mm -hmm. when you look at Hong Kong, which they dealt with the pandemic, you know, they were ready. What they, they say, right? We think. Right. Right. So they are back. Look at, and they are ahead of us with the pandemic, right? So that's my opinion. I hope I'm not wrong. You know, we'll see. Right. Hopefully you're not going, you're not going to interview me in two years and say, Mickey, but you said. Don't worry, I won't bring it up. Mickey, let me ask you about something. So Hudson Yards, big development, uh, millions of square feet, sort of off the grid, right? Like it's totally off the grid. There's no roads that actually go through Hudson Yards. It's a dead end. Uh, what do you foresee happening with it? I mean, there's relying so much on people coming there for the retail and uh, the office uh, population there uh, fueling the residential population. What do you see happening with Hudson Yards now? I have to tell you, I was wrong about the Hudson Yard day before, whenever, before the pandemic, because I didn't buy anything over there. I still remember when I had deals at a ridiculous low price for for development sites and I just, I, I missed this market completely. And you know, part of what, you, none of us is perfect. And I, this is one of my biggest miss. And I felt for, for a couple of years that, wow, I didn't do anything over there. Well, I always feel like you stuck to, you know, great markets like uh, the West Village, Upper East Side, Upper West Side. I never saw you going to pioneering. I, I mean, Borum Hill, I guess that was a place, but that was a right. rental building. Right. But you, you always but, stay to core markets for the most part. Yeah. Uh, look, I think what related, related built and they still going to hopefully continue to build was a huge undertaking. Fantastic. I mean, these guys are, are absolutely professional. Yeah, 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 they're great. What's going to happen to Hudson York? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I bet against it in the past and I was wrong. Yeah. So I don't know if someone can pull it off. Yeah. These guys can, can do it. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd love for them to uh, for that to happen because, as you know, we own office space in Hudson Yards. No, so we, of course, we we're rooting for them to make it work. You know, I was walking around the mall uh, yesterday just to see because they had opened it, and I wanted to see the sort of the foot traffic there. 
And, uh, and, and how was the foot traffic there? It just it made me so sad. It was like watching an aged rock star, you know, on yeah. stage. It was uh, really uh, terrible to see. And I just hope they come up with something with it because it, it also the worst part about it, it reminds me of the Revell. I don't know if you remember the Revell. It was like the biggest development in Atlantic City. They spent yep. $2 billion on it and it went bankrupt within three months. Right. They opened it and closed it within three months. They ended up selling it for like $96 million, which was literally the cost of the windows. Right. Yeah. Uh, it just, yeah, and I'm thinking like it's happened before, like people have been wrong where like you, you're so sure about something working out. Right. And it just, you know. It, but, 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 but to be fair, the Hudson Yard has different legs. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the Revell is, is really about the right. betting about gaming in, in Atlantic City. But they have the office, which, you know, a lot of it is listed. That, that frankly, very nice numbers that I didn't... And a lot of it is sold, too. So, like, you know... Correct. Like, Correct. Hudson Yards 10, 15, they were all, you know, condos. So that'd Correct. Be... And, and, and frankly, the condos that were sold, I, at the beginning, when they, they, were, when they were asking at the high 2,000 foot, I said, how? But they sold, I mean, they did, they did in beautiful buildings, in really great great job so the retail i agree with you that's that's going to be difficult but the question is if if the Hudson yard cannot cannot be a good proposition without a, without the retail i right. don't know yeah it'll be tough i, I hope it works out uh, mickey you work with sovereign funds right like you work with uh, some sovereign funds for the uh, like, do, you, do, you, do you get money investments from sovereign funds like you know Abu Dhabi and uh, places like that? Not so much. No, no, actually not. We um, we worked with uh, in the past. We work with the uh, U.S. Uh, equity funds, mm -hmm. the biggest one in the U.S. Uh, they are great, but they are not. Uh, for example, we think that now there are very interesting opportunities. Uh, we think we think that the time to buy is when. A lot of other people or walk so. through, either they cannot right. because they're too busy to fix the problems or they don't believe in the market. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we're not wrong. Uh, but the US uh, uh, equity funds are, are not really playing now. So, but, but in the last few years, we worked a lot with, uh, with uh, you know, a private uh, family office. Right. Uh, That's more, that, is that usually your, invest, like your investment uh, stack? Yeah, because you know we 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 are. I think, as you know, we are we are very private, and the, you know we we try not to. You know, obviously we we take those the, the interviews, but we are very private in how we we do our business, and and our reputation is very very important for us. Mm -hmm. So, to be successful in this business, you have to have the 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 commercial banks back, banking you, mm -hmm. because I don't pay eight nine percent. I'm not doing it. So I'm, I'm going to the commercial banks. The commercial banks, very careful who they lend to. So our reputation is very important and who is investing us with us is right. very important because the commercial banks are checking it. So we are very, very selective with who, you know, who is investing with us. And, yeah. you know, you managed to have the, you managed to have the very, you know, you came into New York City at the time where the boom just started. Like if you were in New York City development in the 90s, it was not a good time to be in New York City development. You were getting two to 8% or whatever it was. And then the boom started in 2000 or somewhere around there. And then it's sort of, I feel like it sort of ended with the whole Amazon deal and the progressive movement in New York and how landlords and developers are horrible people. And so like, do you feel like you captured just 20 years? How do you foresee development in the next 10 years and just being a, in the business of real estate, but being a landlord and a developer in the next right. 10 years in New York City? So we, we um, again, the first 10 years, we did a lot in New York, but we did a lot outside of New York. We you know, in, in, in the garden style multifamily uh, portfolios and developing in Los Angeles, developing, as I told you, as far as, a, as a Singapore. So we did, we created those, the, the balance between developing, which if we did it right, generated a lot of uh, profit mm -hmm. and cash to invest also in income producing properties. In the last 10 years, we, we focus really on the, the New York market. What we're looking for, as far as we can plan for the next five to 10 years, uh, we, we're looking at other markets other than New York. It's not that we don't love New York. We want to be in New York, 
but we want also to expand to, to expand more our income producing uh, property mm -hmm. properties. And that, that's what really helped any, any real estate uh, company. Development is great. And frankly, it's the most fascinating part of the business. You know, to create something from A to Z is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that you are involved in. But, and, and the income producing is a little bit boring, <laughs> uh, you know, but but it's very important it's very important to have yeah. and that's that's what i'm pushing my team here to you know we 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 are working on many deals to increase our income producing uh, property uh, line well mickey thank you so much for spending this time with us uh, this the interview went a little bit longer than we're supposed to but i really appreciate you staying on i want to thank everybody who tuned in and again, I want to thank Burden Accounting for making this stuff possible and allowing us to talk to people like Mickey so we can understand the market better and understand the business better. And uh, thank you to everyone. And thank you to you, Mickey. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you. Absolutely. Stay thanks, safe. Thanks so much for uh, doing this. I really appreciate it.